Hello, everybody. My name is Abby Bristol, and I'm from the Conservation District, and I'd like to, to welcome you to our fourth Backyard Symposium. This series is designed to connect folks with the natural world around them. This year, we're focusing on farming and gardening. From our backyards to farm fields, our speakers will talk about resources and support for farming and gardening, how you can produce food regardless of land size and more. In the chat, please introduce yourself and share with what you'd like to learn and feel free to interact there throughout the presentations. By default, all attendees are muted and have their cameras off. This allows us to record these presentations so that they can later be uploaded to YouTube chan our YouTube channel for those who could not join us today. Beginning Farmer Part 2 is the name of our presentations today. Welcome to the Van Buren Conservation District's Backyard Symposium webinar series. Message us using the contact form on our website, vanburencd.org forward slash contact hyphen two forward slash, or sign up for our newsletter using the subscribe option at the bottom of our website. The webinar is being recorded. Recorded webinars will be posted next week at www.youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Van Buren CD forward slash videos. Follow us on Facebook at Van Buren CD. Uh, and our Instagram at VBCD uh, VBCDMI. Live captioning is available. Um, if you need to ask any questions, click on the Q&A icon within Zoom to submit a question to the presenter. All questions will be answered at the end of each of all of the presentations. You can type your question in the box and click the send button. Questions will be asked by the moderator at the end of the presentations. Uh, if you need any help, use the chat feature to reach out to me I, as the VBCD moderator, parentheses help for help using Zoom. And today we'll be hearing from um, Alex Florian, Kyle Mead, and Cheyenne Sloan. Our first speaker is Alex Florian. He is the CISMA coordinator for the Van Buren Conservation District and the Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. Alex studied biology at GVSU. He spent summers studying native and invasive fish and spent winters surveying for hemlocks. Alex is the CISMA coordinator for the Southwest by Southwest Corner CISMA, serving Berrien, Cass, and Van Buren counties. He works to reduce the impact of invasive species on our communities. Alex, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Thank you very much for that <laughs> lovely introduction. Slideshow button. Like I said, my name is Alex Florian. I'm the coordinator for the Southwest by Southwest Corner SESMA here at the Van Buren Conservation District. I'm going to be talking today about invasive species and resources that exist to help people with invasive species. So the first question I get from everyone anytime I talk is what is a SISMA? Uh, SISMAs are Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas. We work to address invasive species at a landscape scale. You know, if you have an invasive species on your property, it's not gonna respect property lines, it's not gonna respect county lines. So we work to address those invasive species at that scale that they're able to move. Um, so we partner a lot with county, municipal government, landowners, lake associations. It's a system that's really built on partnerships. Uh, Michigan has 22 different SISMAs and 22 different ways to run a SISMA. So if you're in Southwest Michigan, Berrien, Cass, or Van Buren counties, you're lucky enough to be in my SISMA and you can talk to me about invasive species. But if you're outside that area, but anywhere in Michigan, you are part of a SISMA. Um, and you have a, there is a SESMA coordinator that you can talk to about invasive species issues. You can find all that information at michiganinvasives.org. Uh, 
It's also important to you know, have an understanding of what invasive species are. Invasive species are species that aren't from this area and cause harm to the environment, economy, or human health. Uh, it has to fit both of those. So something like poison ivy is a native species that definitely harms human health. You know, I don't like touching it. I don't think anyone else does either. But it's important to the life cycle of a lot of moths and other species that live in our area, similar to how like monarchs need milkweed, some species need poison ivy. So we don't manage that as an invasive species because it's part of our ecosystem. So usually when I'm talking about invasive species, I'm talking about how they displace native species, how they take up space, but they're not providing invasive or uh, not providing the same services that native species do. Um, but when we're talking about beginning farming and getting going at farming, invasive species also often threaten agricultural products and infrastructure, both of which are very important if you want to have a farm. One example of that is Japanese knotweed. This is a, a plant we work on a lot. It's native to Japan in some really volcanic areas where, you know, a volcano will go off, lava will flow over an area, kill everything above ground, and cool into like solid rock. And then knotweed has evolved to be the first thing to break up through that concrete and to grow after it. Uh, one of my favorite things about the state of Michigan is that we don't have any volcanoes. Love that. Uh, but we do have concrete, we do have other infrastructure. Here's just sort of a horror story of pictures of the Japanese knotweed growing on top of buildings, growing through, straight through a tombstone. I'm sure there's a metaphor there. I'm not going to look into it. Um, here along a stream bank, you know, we often talk about how plants are great at holding the stream banks together and preventing erosion. Uh, knotweed, interestingly, can regrow from just a fragment the size of a pea, floating down, rerooting, and make a whole new plant. So knotweed actually increases the amount of erosion because if it falls off into the bank, it's going to end up downstream, creating a whole new population. Um, unfortunately, you do need to use herbicide in order to manage it. Uh, we've seen people try other things like this tarp here can people see my mess yes um, someone tried to cover it with a tarp if you go through a tarp uh we also and here's another just picture of coming out the side of a building i had a a landowner a couple of years ago was telling me they had not weed growing along the side of their house and it ended up breaking through and causing it to fail, and they had to spend tens of thousands of dollars to fix this. Now, so if it's anywhere near any of your like buildings for your farm, that's gonna be a big issue. Also, if it gets into your fields and you try to just plow it under, you're just gonna move it around and that now it's gonna easily spread through that disturbance around the field. So we Every once in a while, we'll see that where it's just growing in with the corn in a field. Um, another invasive species that we talk about a lot, I feel like I talk about this every time I talk, is spotted lanternfly. Uh, spotted lanternfly, luckily not known in southwest Michigan, but it's in Elkhart, it's in Mishawaka. It's really, really close to where we're at. And it has, does this awesome thing where when it feeds on especially grape crops. It feeds very quickly and creates this sugary substance called honeydew all over the ground, which leads to mold and can also, it can either kill the grape crops or just cause them to fail and not produce any fruit in a given year, which is a really bad thing if you are trying to grow a farm. So <clears throat> it's this insect, oh no. It's this insect right here. Uh, we have traps set up all over our three county service area to look for it. I just want to put in the plug, if anyone ever sees this insect, please give me a call. I want to come kill it. Um, 
<laughs> so how can we help? You know, we talk about invasive species are bad. What can I do for you? Well, one of the main things we do is site visits where I'll come out and we can walk around your property and get an idea of what invasive species are there, how bad it is. I can help you prioritize what areas to start on, what areas maybe save for later, um, and really help you figure out like what's what's going on with an invasive species on your property. We also offer best management practices. So any of this is stuff that you can just find online with a Google search. Unfortunately, especially for stuff like Japanese knotweed, there's a lot of misinformation and uh, not very good information all around as well. So we have, you know, several folders of things that we know come from reputable sources and have evidence-based management practices that we can share with you that'll teach you how to go about managing these invasive species on your property. Uh, you can always reach out, like I said, if you're in Van Buren, Berrien, or Cass County, I'm the person to talk to. Uh, any other county, that michiganinvasives.org website is awesome. That's all okay. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, the chat looked like it was a little bit funky at first, but now it should be going. So I encourage you all to introduce yourself there and let us know where you're coming from and what you'd like to learn today. Next, we're going to in, uh, invite Kyle to the stage. Kyle Mead is the Senior MEEP Specialist for the Van Buren Conservation District. Um, and he's been working with the Van Buren Conservation District since 2004. He specializes in fruit, uh, small fruit and irrigation, and he's helped farmers obtain meat verifications across Southwest Michigan. Kyle, you're up. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about MEEP, which stands for the Michigan Agriculture Environmental Assurance Program and how the program can help you with your farm or with your private land. So the history of MEEP is that uh, in the mid 90s, farmers were starting to talk about how um, they really wished there was someone in state agency or someone that they could talk to to help them navigate rules and regulations that encompass farming. And so after kind of that grassroots effort um, and some time in 1998, MEEP was founded, the Michigan Agriculture Environmental Assurance Program was, was founded to, to help livestock farmers first and foremost. Um, at the time there were permits for livestock farmers that um, they could go through MEEP and not have to do this permitting process, which was kind of a pain in the butt. And then once um, the livestock farmers started working through MEEP and um, kind of getting this initial certifications, um, they were like, well, what about my cropping acres or what about my, my headquarters, my farm stud? Um, who can I ask for help on fuel storage and stuff like that? And around that time, other farmers that didn't have livestock were wanting the same thing. They wanted someone to talk to about some of these rules and regulations that they couldn't really ask anyone about without possibly opening a can of worms and getting themselves in trouble. So meat kind of broadened out and started to cover fruit, vegetables, row crops, everything at the headquarters, greenhouses, and then even more recently, um, forest wetlands and habitats. So yeah, like I said, today we work with just about every crop, forests, wetlands, habitats, um, anything on your farm, we will work with you. And there's me with the nice beep sign that you can get over on the left-hand side. And then that's the state verifier, Joshua, we'll get to a little later. So um, the basis of MEEP, so how it was kind of built that they wanted it to be free to participate in. So my time doesn't cost anything. The verifier that comes out and actually Congrats, congratulates you and gives you the sign is no cost to the farmer or landowner. Uh, it's also confidential. So if in the process we find a problem that, you know, this issue on your farm or on your property or whoever's could pose a potential risk to the environment, we don't go report it to anyone. Um, we're non-regulatory, so we're not going to get you in trouble and we're not going to report it. We want to try and help you fix it. And then participation is also voluntary. So 
we're there on your terms. And if you decide you don't want to go forward or at this point in time, it's not really in the cards for you, um, it can end there and that's okay. MEEP is not a required program. Uh, the way it works is phase one is an educational session or a meeting or talking to someone about MEEP, kind of like what we're doing here today. And then from there, you reach out to your MEEP technician. I cover just Van Buren County. Um, but if you're from outside Van Buren County, you can reach out to me and I will get you in touch with your technician. But from there, you schedule a visit with the MEEP tech where they will come out to your property or your farm. They will go through record keeping and everything about your property that makes it special. And then kind of create a to-do list. And if this is what you want to do, you want to get me verified. These are all the little checklist items that need to be need to happen. Um, this is where the work happens, is in between the to-do list and getting everything done on the to-do list. Where this arrow is, that little space can be anywhere from a couple of weeks, maybe a few months, to sometimes five years. It just all depends. Um, but once you've got everything done, you can get the verifier. And one thing I wanted to mention too is where that arrow lives right now is kind of where um, I get to really shine when I help out with farmers is that I can help find them cost share, help them find solutions to real specific problems that they might have. So the things that kind of we find are issues maybe with fuel. Fuel is a common one that I find is how people are storing bulk fuel. So this is actually an NRCS practice. I think Lucas talked about NRCS programs yesterday. So this is kind of an item that they can cost share to improve your farm that also holds hands with MEEP and makes your farm better in the long term. So you you know we're hypothetical, you're verified. So now what happens? So once your farm is verified, you're allowed to display the sign, but you're not required to. And the verification is good for five years. After that five year point, um, you'll be getting a phone call from me or your technician to redo the assessment that we initially did, um, kind of rebuild a to-do list if there's anything that needs to be redone or that's new that needs to be fixed or implemented before the next verification. And then we schedule the re-verification, um, basically just like we did the first time. Re-verifying is optional. If after the five years you decide it wasn't very valuable to me or my customers didn't notice the sign or anything like that, that's okay. You're not required to re-verify just like you weren't required to go through the program in the first place. So the long-term benefits of MEEP are there's a bunch of them, honestly. There's lower liability insurance through Farm Bureau insurance. So if you're a Farm Bureau member getting your insurance through Farm Bureau, um, they promise, I believe it's a 5% reduction in your liability insurance premium just for going through an assessment, and then 10% if you're verified. Um, if you're not a Farm Bureau insurance subscriber, I guess, you can use that information to kind of work your discount in on your current insurance provider. I've had farmers that had success with that. Um, you can brand with the MEEP logo. So if you're selling your product at a roadside stand or directly to consumers, you can put your meat, the MEEP logo on your product or on your produce, whatever you have, and sell folks this is environmentally assured product that came from an environmentally assured farm. The cost share programs that Lucas talked about, um, you get priority in that. If you have a project that needs to happen to get me verified, you get priority um, on that NRCS cost share to help you get verified. And then there's local cost share. The MEEP program in the Conservation District has smaller amount of cost share for smaller ticket items that we can help you with that NRCS might not really cost share. And then uh, if you have a restricted use pesticide, you can get recertification credits for just participating with just an assessment or a verification. The big benefits are um, in case of accidents, MEEP will go to bat for a farmer. So uh, an accidental spill, which I don't know anyone that spills on purpose, but um, there's accidental spill protection and act of God rain events. So basically if a farmer is applying a commercial fertilizer or a pesticide and the um, a pop-up thunderstorm happens and washes it to a ditch. 
as long as they've documented everything appropriately, they can't be fined or penalized for that discharge. The same as if they if the tank were to rupture and roll or tractor roll over or something catastrophic happened, they can't be fined or penalized for actual accidents. And this is because state legislator decided that if a farmer is going through MEEP and wants to become MEEP verified, then they've mitigated risk as much as they can. Then there's another one that's about the total maximum daily load watershed, which is a watershed that's impaired oftentimes due to phosphorus. And if um, a farmer is farming in one of these watersheds, they can be restricted on the amount of commercial fertilizer that they use or the amount of uh, manure that they apply. But if they're meat verified, then they're unrestricted. They're allowed to still farm as usual because they've looked at all these um, issues and try to pre prevent um, an environmental discharge. Um, the alternative to these is if um, Energy, the Department of Energy, Great Lakes and Environment or EGLE, if they wanted to fine or penalize any of these farmers that weren't meat verified, that's a possibility. And so that's where um, the big benefit comes. So I know that was quick and um, I, covered quite a bit, but, but I'd love, love to talk, talk to anyone that has questions about me, come out to their property or farm. Um, but yeah, there's my contact information. If you got your phone, take a picture of that. Reach out to me if I'm not your meat tech in your county, and I'll get you in touch with them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, we will keep our questions to the end, but feel free to throw them into the Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them after our final speaker. But I would like to introduce Cheyenne Sloan. She is a blueberry and small fruit educator from MSU Extension. Cheyenne Sloan is the blueberry and small fruit educator for Southwest Michigan. She has a background in soil science and horticulture and is passionate about Michigan agriculture. Take it away, Cheyenne. Thank you. Let me just share my screen really quick. I can't hear you quite yet, though. Oh. Can you hear me now? Okay, so Emily can't hear, but that's oh, let me is it good otherwise it sounds like okay, cool. So then I'm sorry that you can't hear me, but I will go move on, continue on. Um cool. So let me present. Hopefully that's showing. Boop, 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 boop. And that is the wrong slide. Um, why is it doing that? Display settings. Uh, okay, cool. Everyone can see good, I'm assuming. No one has Looks said great. Anything. Yeah. Sweet. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so my, thank you for the beautiful introduction. My name is Cheyenne Sloan. I'm um, the Blueberry and Small Fruit Educator, and I work for Michigan State University Extension, um, which is, I think, one of the coolest parts about uh, living in the United States is the fact that we have the Cooperative Extension uh, program, but I have definitely heard that it's one of the best kept secrets um, because there's a lot of stuff that Extension does that you might not realize. And I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about what Michigan State University Extension can do for you. Um, so first things first, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of background information about like why Extension even exists. Um, and that's because of land grant universities. So what exactly is a land grant? Um, a land grant college or university is an institution that has been designated by its state legislature or Congress to receive the benefits of the Morrill Acts of 1862 and 1890 or the Equity and Educational Land Grant Status Act of 1994. Um, so the original mission of these institutions was to teach agriculture, military tactics, and the mechanic arts, as well as classical studies, so that members of the working class could obtain a liberal and practical education. Over the years, land grant status has implied several types of federal support. The first moral act provide grants in the form of federal lands to each state, and the states use these proceeds from selling those federal lands to establish a public institution to fulfill the act's provision, so the education. Um, a, component, a key component of the land grant system is the agricultural experiment station pr 
program created by the Hatch Act of 1887. You might have heard about some of the agricultural experiment stations. There's one in Benton Harbor, Southwest Michigan Research and Extension Center. Um, there's also one in Clarksville. There's one up in the Pinky. There's, a, there's some all over the state. There's a couple all over the state. Um, the Hatch Act authorized direct payment of federal grant funds to each state to establish an agricultural experiment station. So the ones like I mentioned, um, that was then in connection with the land grant institution. Um, depend the amount of money that they get is proportional to like the amount of farmers and stuff um, in the area. Um, but a, a lot of this money has to be uh, met by the state. So then to disseminate all this information that is gleaned at the different research stations um, and at the university, um, the Smith Lever Act of 1914 created was called the Cooperative Extension Service, which is associated with each land grant institution. And this act authorized ongoing federal support for extension services um, and it acts and it also requires states to put in money. So the government, the federal government gives us money, states put in money. Um, and that's why we have extension. So because of this, the Moral Act and because of land grant. So you might've heard land grant before, you might've even seen the pioneer land grant college um, at Michigan State Universities, um, like on some of the signs when you enter uh, campus. So founded in 1855 as the Agricultural College of the State in Michigan, uh, Michigan State University was the nation's first agricultural college and the vanguard for a national movement to make useful advanced education available to the broad public. Um, so Michigan State University is the first one of these, was one of the first land grant institutions. The second one, I believe, was Penn State. So Michigan State is one of the first schools to like teach agriculture in a way that is uh, like a science-based stuff so that theoretically anyone should be able to uh, attend and get an education there. So what is extension then? If we understand what land grant universities are, land grants are supposed to do research and stuff. Um, but just because this research is happening at the universities doesn't mean that it's getting disseminated to regular people like you or me. And that's where extension comes in. Um, so this is a, a diagram <laughs> that shows kind of how we all work together. So the federal, the USDA and NIFA, uh, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture provide funding to the state, which then gives money to land grant universities, which then support academic departments, experiment stations and cooperative extension, um, people like me. Uh, which then work in local offices. I work right here in Van Buren County as an extension educator, um, bridging the gap between research that happens at Michigan State and what people in real life need so that all this cool and awesome science and research that we are finding at the universe that we're figuring out at the university doesn't just stay there. Um, because I don't know about you, but I don't read a lot of scientific papers in my downtime. I only really do it for work. Um, so that's why people like me and educators have jobs to make sure that the information that we have at the, at the university is then being disseminated into uh, the general public. I like to say, there's an extension educator for that. Um, and I'm not exaggerating when I say like pretty much any question that you could think of, uh, you could contact someone at your local land grant university and they should have someone who should be able to answer your question, whether it's like best practices for sleep hygiene, how do I birth a goat? Uh, why is my blueberry look like that? Why is my child being difficult? Like how do I can tomatoes? Any of those questions, someone at Michigan State Extension or one of the other extension uh, entities should be able to help you. So I'm gonna talk about the, there's a lot to, there's a lot that Extension does. It was it's really hard to, to cover it. I could spend like weeks uh, talking about all the awesome things that Extension does, um, but I'm just gonna hit some of the highlights to so that you guys also know some of the highlights and kind of uh, dive further into Extension and what Extension can offer. So I'm gonna, group them into the four institutes. The institutes don't really matter to you guys. It's more of just like an organizational thing, but it'll help for, for like us at, Uni at Michigan State University, but it'll kind of help uh, guide us through all the different things that Michigan State offers. So the first is agriculture and agribusiness. And I think that usually one of the first things people think about if they think about extension or if they know anything about extension is the agriculture part of it. So at Michigan State, we have people that work in all of these different uh, specialties of what uh, 
uh, disciplines. So we have animal agriculture, uh, agriculture, bioenergy, beginning farmer, floriculture, fruit and nuts, gardening, vegetables, all kinds of education and experts associated with these uh, different topics. So in plant agriculture, I don't know if you guys knew this, but Michigan is uh, one of the most diverse states in the country for as far as agriculture goes. So we have a lot of different types of plants um, and animals that are being grown and uh, grown here in Michigan. So through Michigan State, you're able to get soil testing done. Um, we're able to get, we offer a bunch of different workshops and classes for RUP, continuing education credits, tons of workshops, whether it's pruning or how to take a soil test or how to do a manure test, um, all kinds of different types of education. If you've heard of Great Lakes Expo, um, that a lot of uh, educators, we don't put it on, but we help with all the educational programming for Great Lakes Expo. Additionally, if you're ever in your backyard and you're like, what the heck is this bug? This looks weird and it's not a, um, a spotted lantern fly. You can take it into, you can bring us a, a spotted lantern fly too, but you can take it into your local extension office. And if there's not someone on staff there that can help you figure out what the plant is or bug is, uh, we can help you fill out forms or send it in to our bug people on campus. Or like I have a uh, one of my coworkers, he's an entomologist. So whenever we get bug, we don't have an entomologist at my office, but whenever we get bug samples brought in, I'll, I'll like text him a picture and be like, Mike, what the heck is this? Um, and he'll help me. Or people bring in weeds all the time. Um, so I help identify different weeds people have or other kinds of random plants that they might find in their yard or in their field. Um, and then additionally, any kinds of questions that you might have in regards to plant uh, production or just growing plants. You're like, I why is my blueberry bush dying? I get that question a lot. Or um, how do I how do I grow a, a Gerber daisy? Um, or why are my plums not blooming? Or why are my plums still blooming? Or whatever um, are all questions that we'll be able to help with. So um, I'm able to speak a little bit more in depth on what a fruit educator does because that's what I am. I'm a fruit educator. Here's me with all my coworkers. Um, we do a lot of education on best practices for like IPM or soil sampling or nutrition, uh, plant nutrition. Uh, we all have different specialties. And if like I can't answer your question, I can get you in contact with one of my uh, coworkers who can answer the question. We do pruning demos. You can ask us like, what's eating my fruit? Or why does my fruit look like that? Um, I just bought a blueberry farm, now what? Or, um, and then we also do a lot of event planning, um, mostly just for educational events, because uh, that's our main mission, just to educate. Um, so then there's also animal agriculture. We have a ton of educators that work in animal agriculture. Um, one of their really big programs is E-Rail, which is the emergency response for accidents involving livestock. So uh, these people train first responders how to like corral cows and pigs if there's ever like a tip over on 94 or something. Um, it's a really, really cool program. Um, that Michigan State helps run. Uh, they do classes on manure management, tons of workshops. And like, if you have a question, like, why does my chicken look like that? Why is it my sheep eating? Um, things like that. People at Extension um, are able to help you uh, get your answers. Uh, another really important thing, um, I don't really like money, but money's really, really important. Um, so farm finance is another pretty, is another big uh, part of, of extension. So they have Tell Farm, um, and Tell Farm is a uh, is a tool that uh, that farmers can use to help um, with their to help like manage the data on their farm um, and all their finances and stuff like that. It's a really really cool program. It's been around since the 1950s. Um, there's the Demand series, which is talking about uh, farm finance for for new farmers, um, succession planning. So like, what do you do when you want to retire and like pass on your farm to your kids or your dad needs to pass on the farm to you or whatever. Um, they do a bunch of workshops. They have recently had a, a series of, um, uh, webinars. We're on a webinar. Uh, they recently had a series of webinar all about the farm bill that was really awesome. I didn't know a lot about the farm bill, bill and I went to, I attended a couple of those um, and learned a lot about how the farm bill works and why it's really important. And then also if you have any questions that have to do with money or like 
farm labor or taxes and things like that, someone at Extension will be able to help you figure that out um, or point you. And if if they don't know, they'll be able to point you um, in the right direction, kind of like a library. You go to the library to find an answer and the librarian can help you kind of figure out where to look for your different answers if they don't have the answer themselves. Um, another thing that I really think is awesome and cool that Michigan State, that Extension does, is we have a farm stress program. Um, farmer, farming is one of the most stressful jobs in the, in the world um, with one of the highest rates of suicide and other mental health uh, among um, professions. So through a couple of different grants and programs to the UN through the federal government, um, Michigan State Extension offers um, just a bunch of resources about responding to farmers in need, um, like uh, financial and management guides, and um, offer they uh, there's even free counseling that they offer through some of these programs, uh, so that people are able to get the help that they need um, when dealing with stress. This can be a very very stressful job. Um, another thing that you might have heard of um, is Master Gardener. You might have heard of the Master Gardener program. It's one of uh, Extension's like flagship programs. Um, and so what it is, is a bunch of you sign up to become a Master Gardener. You take a course, whether some of them are offered online, some of them are offered in person, and you get the basics of gardening and the basics of science so that you are able to take science into your own backyard. Um, one of the main parts of being a master gardener is you're supposed to do a, a volunteer hours. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways you can do volunteer hours. It's a really awesome program. Um, one really great way to do volunteer hours, or if you have, if you are interested in the master gardener program uh, here in Van Buren County, right at the Pawpaw, uh, count at the Pawpaw Extension office, uh, right in downtown Paw near, I guess, right outside of downtown Pawpaw, um, we have our Van Buren County um, Veterans Garden with a bunch of master gardeners work there. It's a really cool program. You get to learn a lot and you get to attend a bunch of awesome events. Um, and then here's just a couple other examples of things that Michigan State Extension publish, uh, helps publish or published, like uh, different uh, might pests or uh, just uh, uh, a bulletin about Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly, wheat performance tiles, and then um, what a farm financial statement works. And so another thing that's really cool about Extension that I didn't really mention before is um, what a lot of farmers like about it specifically is that we are an unbiased source of information. Like it doesn't matter, like if you're asking me what I think about fertilizer or a variety or whatever, I don't care if you buy my variety or a different variety or if you buy fertilizer or you don't fertilizer, I'm still going to get like I, my my salary and such doesn't affect it. Um, but so like completely unbiased information, all science based um, here is what you're getting when you uh, work with Extension. So another part of Extension is the Community Food and Environment Institute. And so they catch all, they catch a whole bunch of different stuff. They do everything from urban planning to public policy. They do home ownership classes, uh, tourism assessments, all kinds of really cool stuff um, here as well. So one example of a program that they have is their Farm to Institution Network. And what it is is working with institutions like schools, um, like schools, <laughs> pretty much, uh, to get farm fresh food from Michigan. And so you might have heard the 10 cents a meal program. Um, for every 10 cents you spend on local food, you're able to get uh, fresh local food, you're able to get extra 10 cents towards your um, food budget. Uh, really awesome program that's run through the federal, federally, but Michigan State Extension helps uh, with that. And then there's Citizen Planner. So the Michigan State Citizen Planner Program offers land use education for locally appointed and elected planning officials and interested residents throughout Michigan. This is a non-credit course and it leads you to a certificate com of completion. Um, so you're able to be like a, a citizen planner. Um, you're also able to become a master citizen planner. Um, you're able to take this online or in person. It's a really, really cool program. Um, a lot of elected uh, either locally elect like elected officials will go through this to better understand like how do you plan a city and stuff 
Um, then there's the Product Center. So the Michigan State Product Center helps Michigan entrepreneurs and businesses to develop and launch new product and service ideas into the food, ag, and bioenergy markets. Whether you're a budding entrepreneur or operate a well-established company, the Product Center is your key to the front door of Michigan State University's vast and very technical expertise, research, and outreach services. So this is really awesome. They're a really cool resource if you're more if you're interested in like starting a potato chip brand or kind of moving um, from like one level to another within your uh, within your business. Um, they do a bunch of awesome stuff. Um, they've worked with Great Lakes Potato Chip Company, Brazilian Oven um, as two examples. Um, and they're really cool. They do really cool stuff. Another program that is offered through the Community Food Environment Institute is the Master Naturalist, the Michigan Naturalist Program. Um, and the it's a you take a series of classes where you um, learn to identify different plants and learn how to be like a good steward of the environment. And at the end you get a, um, like a, you get to be, you're a certified Michigan nat master, master naturalist. Um, here's some other like, um, what are they called? Publications that they've put out. So one thing that I think is really helpful and really nice is they'll do, uh, uh, they'll do like summaries of different ballot proposals. Um, unbiased will just tell you the facts like about the proposal background and will tell you everything that it changes, which is super cool. Um, Beginning Farmer, I thought this was extra ap applicable. Uh, they put together, uh, some of my coworkers put together a whole Ape, like a huge uh, packet of grants for farmers um, and just different grant opportunities. And then another really cool thing that Extension can do is they can give you a tourism assessment. Um, and so they can come to your city and be like, this, this is the tourism capabilities of your city. Um, so then there's also the Health and Nutrition Institute. Um, so the Health and Nutrition Institute covers a whole bunch of stuff, health, nutrition, um, socio, uh, social emotional health, uh, diabetes management, food safety, a uh, aging gracefully, nutrition and physical activity, and tons of other different stuff. Um, one of their like flagship programs is the food safety and preservation. Um, I know there's a, there can be a lot of like kind of sketchy information out there about food preservation. I've seen some really scary stuff on Facebook about like home, like cheating how to like the cheat way to do a uh, different um, preservation, which is like not really the best um, always. So if you ever have questions, if you're like canning or have questions about food preservation, um, Michigan State Extension has tons of resources and you're able to call the food safety hotline. Um, I've definitely had people, I've definitely recommended people call this food safety hotline before. So if you're like, hey, uh, I just canned these tomatoes and I'm not really sure, you can talk through the uh, what you did and why you're concerned and they can help you, help guide you to your question um, or help give you an answer to your question or tell you like, yeah, it's totally fine. Or mm, maybe you should try this or just throw it away or whatever. Um, they also do a bunch of classes on cottage food law. Cottage food laws uh, can be really awesome if you're looking to expand like uh, how, how you're making your income and stuff like that. So uh, Michigan State Extension offers a bunch of different classes about cottage food law. Um, and then there's also SNAP Ed, which so Michigan State partners with Michigan Department of Health and Human Services um, to do, provide SNAP Ed, which is a free nutrition education program that's aimed to reduce hunger and food insecurity and promote healthy eating habits. Um, they visit a lot of like schools and stuff where they talk about healthy eating and like lots of colors on your plate and stuff like that. You might um, most often they uh, I hear I don't most often I hear about them visiting schools and things like that, or at least the woman that I work with um, who works in the SNAP ad program visits a lot of schools and does like uh, nutrition education. And it's really cool. Another thing that I had recently found out about and I didn't realize Michigan State even offered is there's sleep education for everyone. Um, the sleep program is developed by sleep researchers and a sleep, a sleep medicine specialist and Michigan State educators um, to put together this really, this program to teach you how to sleep well and sleep healthily. Um, and then finally, there's the Children and Youth Institute, another like flagship part of Extension you might have heard about before. I know it was the only thing I'd heard about before I started working for Extension um, was 4-H. 
Um, so they have 4-H and then they also do a bunch of stuff for educating families. Um, so they offer tons of different parenting classes. So like how to build uh, emotional skills in young children, creating safe environments for youth. Uh, if you have a question about being a parent, they have some, they have classes or books, I mean, not books or articles to kind of help you with that because they don't give you a manual when you become a parent, parent uh, and you kind of have to figure it out. So uh, Extension is able to help a little bit with that. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, 4-H, which stands for hand, heart, head, heart, hands, and health. I personally was never a member of 4-H, um, but now that I work with Extension, I'm able to help out at things like the Van Buren Youth Fair. That might be, if you're not, if you don't have a kid in 4-H or personally know people with 4-H, this might be um, your experience with 4-H uh, would be attending the county fairs. The county fairs usually have a 4-H component to them. Not always, but most almost always um and so when you if you either have kids in in 4-h or you want to become a volunteer and uh work with 4-h they teach all kinds of things it's not just showing pigs or cows or anything like that um they also do art and they do uh like leadership and serve it uh and like community service tech uh like stem so like robotics and all kinds of really awesome it's a really cool program um and it's offered at most schools have 4-H or most communities have some kind of 4-H presence in them, especially here in Southwest Michigan. Um, and so kind of to wrap it up, I want to tell you guys about Ask an Expert. Uh, so if you have, I was talking earlier about how like extension is lots of question answering. Um, and if you have a question, there's probably someone at Michigan State who is an expert and will be able to answer your question. Um, so if you don't want to call someone like me or do a lot of, whole lot of digging about who to contact, you can just go to ask2.extension.org and type in your question and submit it. And it'll get routed to an expert. Um, if you ask a question about blueberries and you're in Michigan, I'll probably get it. Um, if you ask a question about apples and you're up near Grand Rapids, my uh, coworker Lindsay would get it. Um, or if you ask about a question about apples and you're in Minnesota, someone in Minnesota will probably get it. So it's all across the country and you don't, and it's just not plants. You could also ask about like zoning laws or you can ask about uh, food safety and things like that. It's not just agriculture or plant related. Uh, and that is all I have. Thank you guys for listening to me. I, that was, I know that was a lot of information. Yeah. Hopefully you guys are uh, at least able to uh, see all the cool stuff that Extension can do for you. Um, here's my contact information if you have any questions or if you want me to point you in the direction of who to ask your questions, I'd be happy to help uh, make those connections. Thank you so much, Diane. Yeah. Uh, greatly appreciate that with so many resources. Um, we will move on to our questions now. So feel free to throw your questions into the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen. We do have a few questions. Um, we'll start with the first one that we got. Alex, this one will be for you. Um, it's in regards to um, Japanese knotweed. What's the duration of that plant? I think they mean the lifespan. Um, the, they, they say that the uh, most plants don't grow indefinitely. Are there studies to show how the species interventions might might uh, affect that? Yeah, thank you for the question. I saw it when it came in and was thinking about it the whole time. Um, so when we think about like plant succession, like if knotweed was growing in a field, and that field eventually turned into a forest and grow it might shade out the knotweed i'm not sure i see it in like deep forests on rare occasions and it doesn't seem to spread out of control in those situations but most of where we see it is like roadsides and mowed areas and up next to buildings that are constantly being disturbed so there's no it's always in that early successional state and it also, like I said, it in, increases erosion. So it sort of promotes those early successional uh, environment. So, uh, I mean, it's a, it's rhizonymous, it's perennial, and those plant, those roots especially are probably lasting decades down there, uh, just kind of waiting for an opportunity to spread. What's uh, rhizominous mean? Yeah.
Great, thank you, Alex. Um, for that, for those that answer, or for whoever asked that, if you had follow up questions, feel free to reach out to Alex for for more on that. Um, another question for Alex: uh, Can you identify plants to see if they're invasive? Yeah, if you send me pictures of plants, I can identify them. Um, I always appreciate like lots of pictures, close ups of the plant broad pictures of where it's growing. And I will say there's a lot of plants I can't identify. And when I can't do it, I do send it to that MSU's Ask an Expert form. So that's also always an option. Yes, we like to, to engage with our partners as much as we can. Um, this other question I will ask to everybody here, CISMA, BBCD, and for MSU at E, are there any events coming up? Uh, Alex, do you want to start since you've you chat you chat now? Yeah, so we have our Sisma's annual meeting coming up on February sixteenth. Uh, there's a sign up for that on our website, where we're going to talk about all our different programs, engage with partners, um, and everything else we do. I've also got a program in Niles at the public library there on March 16th, and a program at the library in Decatur also on March 26th coming up. Thank you. Uh, Kyle, you want to tell us next what BBCD has? Uh, yeah, so um, BBCD has our Farming for the Future event on March 13th, is that right? And um, at the Van Buren Conference Center in Lawrence, um, I don't know the address off the top of my head, but there's information on our website. Um, and then this week, short notice, but this week is uh, Southwest Michigan Horticulture Days at the Mendel Center um, in Benton Harbor, which is a great Two day show if you've got um, fruits or vegetables, and then you'll get to hear about meat again. And then we'll have a booth so you can ask us myself and the text from Southwest Michigan questions in person if you'd like. So, great, thank you. Uh, if again, if you have, uh, if you wanted to look further into the VBCD's events, you can go to our website, vanburencd.org, and click on events, and you'll see a calendar there. Shan, do you have any events coming up? Yeah, so um, at the on the blah, 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 on February fifteenth, we'll be offering in person core testing, um, in person testing for RUP credits in at in Allegan County, um, and then at the Allegan County Human Services Building, I'll put a link for that in here. Um, I'll be there teaching Pete will be it'll be the review and then also the test so you don't have to take it online if you don't want to take it online. Um, we'll also be offering that in the middle of March I don't remember the exact day I don't think it's on the calendar like on the like official MSU calendar yet that'll also be offered in Benton Harbor in the middle of March. Um, additionally at the end of the month there is this super awesome program called Michigan State Fruit School. This will be our first year offering it after a couple, it's been on a hiatus for a couple of years now, um, targeted to uh, people who want to have better science, um, informing their fruit, make their fruit planning decisions. Super awesome program, end of the month. Uh, sign up is only until the until Friday. So sign up soon if that's something that you're interested in. Um, and yeah, so those are the, the and then also Southwest Hortes. Please come to Southwest Hortes. It'll be awesome. Um, I'm hoping with that. Um, and I hope to see lots of people there. Awesome. So exciting. So much going on. We still have time for other questions. So feel free to throw them into the Q&A. Um, there were some other questions. Let's see. Uh, Cheyenne, you, you had so many resources that you shared with us. Um, is there an exhaustive list that, that someone could go through and click through to see, hey, I don't really know what I need. Let me look through. Um, so I threw in the the, the canner.msu.edu slash outreach. That's kind of where um, that'll, that'll be the, a good place to start because then you can like click, uh, it'll like kind of sort you into different categories. So you're like, oh, I have a natural resource question or a gardening question. And then you can kind of click um, there. And honestly, if you, uh, 
reach out to your local extension office just like call the the office and be like hi i have this question and they will be able if they don't know exactly who to talk to they can point you to someone else who can point you to someone else um everyone we all just want to answer your questions like that's what we 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 live for <laughs> so it's really exciting when people come um with fun questions and stuff like that so don't hesitate to reach out to your uh extension office that's awesome it's also probably good to give get a hold of them so you can chat with figure out the whole network and, and engage with them uh kyle i had a question for you too um is there a minimum size of a farm or a wetland or forest whatever you're going to be verifying that um, a property owner would need in order to be a meat verifier uh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, for forest wetland and habitat, it's kind of, well, I guess all of it. It's kind of case by case basis. Um, for for farms specifically, they, would, they want folks to be selling produce or selling something off the farm. So it's not just a, a personal garden. Um, but for the forest wetland habitat, there's a lot of different features that hold higher value. So like a vernal pool can be very small, but we will verify that on its own basically because it's such a high priority and a cool feature in a wetland or a woods or on a farm that we can do a forest wetland habitat verification on just a small vernal pool. So long story short, it's kind of case by case basis, but um, smaller farms and woodlots and everything are absolutely fine i'd rather rather you reach out to me and me get out of the office and see your property and we can answer it like that way so thank you in our q a section we've got another question um i'll let anybody answer this who feels ready for it who and how might i start with on with scaling up juice and cider production Who wants to take that one? Um, so we have uh, Michigan State has an educator uh, in Southeast who does a lot of cider production and has some cider production education um, that he would be able to help you. His name's Derek Plutkowski. I can pop his information um, in the chat really quick. Um, he would be a good place to start. There's also the Michigan Craft Beverage Association, which I might not be like, which is none of us. Um, but they are uh, a council, Michigan Craft Beverage Council. Um, they can help you with, I guess it would also depend on like what stage you are. Um, if you're like looking for more people to, to sell to, um, but they can help with more people like looking for people to sell to and stuff like that. Uh, and the Michigan State also, Extension also has like food safety educators and people who can come out and be like, that's not food safe or like help you kind of get to um, like be able to pass uh, inspections and things. I don't know as much about food safety. That might be more, Kyle might be able to speak a little bit more to that than I do, so. The produce, I know more about produce safety, which I think they used to call food safety, if that might be what you mean, Cheyenne. So they're looking more at the handling of um, produce um, and packaging and not so much the value added stuff like juice and beverages. So I think your um, original contact there might be the best fit for kind of going to that stage. Um, uh, our, our produce safety technician for this area though, to kind of cover that timeline or that piece of the stage of the um, juice and cider would be Patrick, um, I can't think of his, Patrick Gordon, that's right. He's out of the Bering Conservation District office. Um, are you looking up his contact? Yeah. And so we'll put that in the chat. So he could help you with um, safely harvesting and storing and packaging it um, kind of for the duration till you juice it or, or, or press it for cider. So that would be helpful. And then from there, I'm not really sure, unfortunately. Cheyenne, did you have something that you wanted to add to that? I was just having a hard time finding Patrick's uh, email on the internet, but I found it. And uh, based on a comment that Julian just made, they say that they're in Southwest Michigan and Derek's in Southeast. Is that okay? 
yeah no so he does he'll do uh it, we don't care uh where you are um because he does he's the only person who really does cider as far as our he's like the main cider guy so um we send everyone to him um and if he if you contact him and he thinks that you should talk to someone else he'll tell you like oh go talk to um yeah no it shouldn't matter okay very good well, that about wraps it up. Um, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to our speakers. They'd be happy to hear from you. Let me share my screen here real quick. Thanks again for attending this session of the Van Buren Conservation District's Backyard Symposium webinar series. We'll hope you join us for, for more of our such sessions. Message us using the contact form on our website, vanburencd.org slash contact dash two slash forward slash or sign up uh, for our newsletter using the subscribe option at the bottom of our website. This webinar is being recorded and recorded webinars will be posted the following week at www.youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Van Buren CD forward slash videos. Follow us on, on Facebook at Van Buren CD and on Instagram at VBCDMI. Please join us tomorrow for our community gar gardens talk with Dewey Cook. Thank you so much, folks, and we hope you have a good day.